Good evening, everybody. It's Thursday, the 10th of November, 2022. I'm Dave Rovery, the Professor of Planetary Geosciences at The Open University. With me is my colleague, Eleanor Favreau, who you'll be hearing from very soon. Welcome here to the Open STEM Labs. This is an event especially for S283 students, but we've also invited OU Geological Society, OU Space Society, and the Moon's Facebook group. So whichever of those communities you belong to, uh, welcome. Now, we're here to answer your questions, so please do ask us questions. We had no questions sent in in advance, so we're going to need some live questions from you. But we're going to begin by introducing ourselves, talking about what we do, and picking up on some current or very recent planetary science news. So, Eleanor, you're in the next door office to me. I am, yes. I kind of know what you do, but these good people don't, so... <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Dave. So I am a postdoc researcher uh, here at the Open University, and I'm an alien geomorphologist, uh, specifically interested in the surface of Mars. So my job is to characterize the landing site for the ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover, which I've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, and I am interested in anything the wind does or did uh, or is doing. Uh, and how those alien modifications to the surface of Mars um, is reflected in what we see when we uh, take a look at satellite images or uh, images sent back by the rovers and landers. And this is kind of relevant to S283. You should be on about Chapter 4 now, and aeolian processes are tucked away there at the, uh, end, of at the end of the chapter after a whole load of impact processes. <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, reading the bits of the textbook. Um, Alien processes are some of the most pervasive uh, agents of geologic and geomorphic change across the solar system. Um, the wind has had almost three billion years to work its magic on the surface of Mars. Uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite a force on Earth, and, um, and we're, we're finding that elsewhere in the solar system we have features that look like they could have been formed by winds. So quite a bit of uh, interesting research going on in the solar system, for sure. Now, you disappeared over the summer because you went to Iceland. What's that got to do with Mars? I did, <laughs> yes. So uh, part of my work is looking at analog research sites. So uh, any site that approximates to some degree uh, the surface of Mars uh, for my purposes specifically. So Iceland is actually a really great uh, analog. Uh, it's a mostly basaltic uh, location. It's got a ton of uh, vol active volcanoes, as as you might recall. In the summer, in the summer, there was a uh, an eruption, um, and in satellite imagery, we were able to find uh, mega ripples, which are these really interesting ripple granular ripple bed forms that we find on Earth, and we also find them on Mars. On Mars, we call them transverse Aeolian ridges. Um, Mega ripples on Earth uh, have two different modes, uh, grain size distribution modes to them. So you've got a, uh, a coarse, often denser uh, armoring layer uh, on top of fine grain materials. And actually, we have a photo from the field um, that I took that we might be able to bring up. Well, we've got the satellite pictures of Mars first, haven't we? Let's oh, see we do. What, yeah. We do have the satellite pictures of Mars. So let me take you through those before we go into what it looks like on Earth. So these are some of the features that I study on Mars, the periodic bedrock ridge, the transverse Aeolian ridge, dust devils and wind streaks. Um, these may or may not be familiar features to you, uh, so we'll just go through them briefly here. A periodic bedrock ridge is essentially a large ridge of well, bedrock, they're cohesive <laughs> substrate. It's not granular. So if you think of uh, ripples on Earth uh, as, as being sort of those, those nice um, sinuous ridges you see on a beach, for example, um, scale that up uh, to, to you know, the meter or decameter scale uh, and make that completely out of rock and you have the periodic bedrock ridge. And these actually form on Earth as well. Um, I did my uh, PhD fieldwork on these in um, Argentina. Uh, we also have those transverse Aeolian ridges I mentioned, the TARS. Uh, those are like mega ripples. Uh, we have different names for them uh, because mega ripple on Earth denotes that bimodal grain size distribution I just mentioned. Uh, and we're not really able to discern 
grain size distributions from orbital image, images on Mars. So we, we give them a different name until we're sure uh, what we're looking at is a mega ripple. Uh, I also study dust devils and their associated wind streaks. Um, and a dust devil is a convective feature uh, that is formed with uh, wind vortices close to the surface. Um, and these have been captured by orbital images. As you can see here, that's what the yellow arrow is pointing to, that bright flash. There is a dust devil. Um, and if you enhance the photos where you know dust devils of moons, you can all often see the streaks that they leave behind because as they move across the surface, they disrupt the, the dust that uh, has settled uh, on the surface of Mars. So you're able to map these, um, these streaks to get an idea of, of which way the dust devils are moving. And there's another dust devil uh, in, in that wind streak photo there, that, that big black blob. Um, you can also see dust devils from surface platforms. So Curiosity rover uh, has, has captured quite a few of them. Yeah. So which of these did you find in Iceland? Well, we saw dust devils. Yeah. Uh, they were often too short-lived for us to be able to get our cameras out and take a nice photo of them. Uh, but we did see them uh, across the landscape. We saw a lot of ventifacts, which are wind abraded rocks. Um, and we have a nice photo here. This is a terrestrial laser scanner. Um, set up to to analyze the rocks that you see in the middle ground there. Um, we went to to Iceland for a, a number of different reasons. This particular bit of our field work uh, is is three D reconstructing these uh, ventifact outcrops uh, uh, in the lab so that we can study them and compare them to the models of uh, from the camera that we took that emulates the camera on the ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover. So we'll be able to compare the model from the terrestrial laser scanner and the model from the PanCam emulator and uh, essentially have an idea of how well the PanCam emulator works uh, so that when we finally get to Mars, we're able to sort of hit the ground running. We know what our uh, pipelines are. We know how close or how far we can be from a feature to get some accurate measurements from it. Um, and we waste no time sort of trying to figure that out when you're on Mars, because that's not really the ideal place to be testing these things out. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in the next photo, um, we have a, a, a pit, essentially, of, of uh, this is what we dug, a colleague, uh, Steve, dug this. Um, and this shows the stratigraphy of these mega ripples that we saw in Iceland. Uh, as you can see there, there's um, a, whoop, oh, if we go back to the, yep, yeah, there we go. Uh, you can see at the top there, um, there is a, uh, a line, yes, there it is, of, of sort of darker grains. Those are coarser basalt grains, uh, and those armor some coarse and some fine pumice grains, those, those, those uh, lighter clasts lighter and, and less dense clasp beneath. But these um, aren't sand grains. These, these are a centimeter or so across, aren't they? It's hard these, to see the scale, but they are chunky. They are pretty chunky. I actually have uh, with me a few samples that I brought back from Iceland. So if we can just zoom in on these right here. So what you were seeing, let's see, is this is a, oh, there we go. This is a basalt grain, uh, and it's not really a you know, a grain in the traditional sense. It's, it's more of a cobble here. Um, but that was blown by the wind. This would have been blown by the wind, yeah. And we don't know, you know, when it formed or how far it's been mobilized, but that certainly has been um, wind blown. Uh, we also have, you know, a much larger, uh, but a lot less dense and far more angular, chunky pumice. So Dave, if I gave this to you, you know, that's a pretty... Yeah, that's, um, that's very light, folks. Very She's telling light. you the truth, whereas, yeah, this is much heavier, so it's, it's, it's denser. It's a far denser. Although, being, although it's bigger, although it's smaller, it's heavier. So yeah. this is full of void space, is air bubbles. And yes. This, this has just a few large bubbles in it. A few large bubbles, yes. But even so, I'm really surprised to see that blown by the wind. I mean, yeah. this, the area of, um, of Iceland that we were in is, is, is quite windy. Uh, we had instrumentation up um, when it was blowing about you know 30 meters a second. Not too much was moving, but there was one evening there where uh, we didn't have our instrumentation out, uh, 
but anecdotally we were standing around on the on the deck and it was uh, maxing out our instrumentation so more than 60 right. meters a second it was quite quite quick so having so. seen these mega ripples armored with pebble-sized clasts in mm -hmm. iceland do you think that occurring on Mars too, potentially? Yes, yes I do. So, uh, especially at the sites that uh, we showed uh, in that second panel uh, on the slide there, those, those particular uh, mega ripples or those TARS uh, are static over observable time, the observable time we have for, for that area of Mars. Now, not all TARS on Mars are static. Some near the poles are actually quite active. Uh, a Curiosity rover actually uh, dug in to a, a tar, uh, and we were then able to classify it as a mega ripple because when we dug into it, we could see that there was a coarser grains armoring uh, finer grains beneath. Exactly so, like you saw in Iceland. Exactly like okay. we saw in Iceland. It was a, I mean, the grain size distribution was very different, but the, the, the difference was, uh, was still evident. So, oh, great. Yeah. So it was great. So um, we've talked a lot about Mars. So Dave, um, I just wanted to uh, ask, I know a lot of the viewers will know that you're involved with the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury. But is there anything else in the, uh, in the recent news that has sort of crossed your desk and you thought was interesting you want to share? Well, the, the, there's been a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. The story that I've chosen to talk about is the NASA's DART mission, which uh, on the 27th of September, um, crashed into an asteroid deliberately. Mm -hmm. DART is the dual asteroid redirection test. <coughs> the, it's, t it's a test of whether you can crash something into an asteroid and not smash it to pieces. Because mm -hmm. many asteroids are just rubble piles, they're not solid rock. Right. If you hit it at kilometres per second, there's a fear it will fall apart, which is the last thing you want to do if you've got an asteroid heading for Earth. You don't want to turn it into half a dozen asteroids yeah, heading no. to it. So you need to be able to hit it and change its velocity. Mm -hmm. So let's change its direction or its speed so it's no longer going to hit the Earth. So they, they smashed deliberately this spacecraft into an asteroid. It mm -hmm. was a 500 and something kilogram, half a ton half spacecraft wow. traveling at six kilometers a second. And rather than it, the, this asteroid whose name is Didymos, they went for its moon. The moon is called Dimorphos, the oh, moon being smaller. Right. And the idea was that it's easier to measure the change in the orbit of an asteroid's moon than it is to measure the change in the orbit of, of, a, of an oh, independently gosh. moving asteroid. Okay. So they smashed DART into Dimorphos mm -hmm. to see if they could not break it apart, but change its orbit. And, and it worked. It worked. It was, a, it was a brilliant success. Now, we've got some slides. Um, so this is a view from DART as it approached. Lower left is Didymos, which is just over half a kilometer, half a kilometer in diameter. And above right of it is Dimorphos, its moon, which is only 160 meters across. Oh, OK. And um, typically, typical asteroids, um, lots of boulders on the surface. You'll see much more detail when we get closer in. The next slide, I think, is a close-up. That's a close-up of the target body. So that's Dimorphos, 160 metres across. So the biggest boulders you see there are the order of 10 or 15 metres across. And the boulders down to all sizes, you can see. And that's more or less the centre of that hemisphere is where the spacecraft hit. And uh, I think next we've got a video of, from DART as it approached. Is this a video? Yeah, if we hit play. It jiggles around because the spacecraft's uh, little vector jets were being fired to make sure it stayed on, on target. And things will get quite dramatic pretty soon. And we're going to lose uh, Didymos out of the field of view and um, head in at six kilometres a second relative velocity into um, Dimorphos here. Brace for impact, everybody. It didn't slow down. They're just slowing down the pictures. That's the last picture it transmitted before it died. Wow. Um, now, it flung up quite a big plume of ejector, which was seen by telescopes from Earth. Mm -hmm. But it was also seen by a little CubeSat. DART took an Italian mission oh. called Lycia Cube with it, which it sort of dropped off behind it, and it followed in. Mm -hmm. um, a 
couple of hundred kilometres behind, I guess, and actually imaged the impact. Oh, wow. Because the, the DART spacecraft was killed in the impact. So let's see the... This is a little video from... Oh, from... Um, I think we've already gone past the start. We'll let that play again if we can. This is it receding. We'll go, go back to the beginning, perhaps. OK, here we are approaching. You can see the plume, bottom right is the plume that's already been, the impact's happened. That's the ejector plume uh, coming off the target body and we've now flown by. So the big thing at the top right is the, is the parent asteroid, um, Didymos, and Dimorphos is the little one with the sort of cloud of ejector being flung out of it. Let's just let that play for a second. Big cloud of ejector, streaky ejector as well, not, not uniform, it, it's come out in streaks. Uh, but you can tell as we recede away that the, the asteroid moon, Dimorphos, is still intact. It was mm -hmm. not broken apart. Well, that's great. And that's important. And now, did it work in changing the moon's orbit? Yes, it did. Let's look at the final couple of graphics. Here's the principle of it. Uh, Didymos was passing into... The, uh, Dimorphos was passing into the shadow of Didymos, and that's the big dip in the light curve you see there. And um, the next graphic is showing um, a plot of, uh, of when these big dips in the light curve occur. Now, before the impact, the orbital period of Dimorphos about Didymos was uh, 11 hours, 55 minutes. Mm -hmm. After the impact, it had been shortened to 11 hours, 23 minutes. So they shaved half an hour after the orbital period. Wow. So it worked. Uh, and, and there are the data um, that were published a couple of weeks ago, it worked. It, it worked. A lot of ejector was thrown out, but the thing didn't break apart, mm -hmm. and we changed its velocity. So, if we find an asteroid on a collision course with Earth, we know we can fire something into it mm -hmm. that will not, will probably not break it apart, and change its velocity by a certain amount. And if you change its velocity sufficiently, it will no longer hit the Earth. So we're moving towards uh, protecting ourselves from incoming uh, space debris. Now, an asteroid of this size isn't going to wipe out civilization. Mm -hmm. If you hit a city, the city would be destroyed. Do hit damage. the ocean, you get a pretty nasty tsunami. Yeah. So we, we can stop these things coming in. So that's Well, that's good. Actually, that brings us to a question that Andrew has. Um, Oh, yeah. uh, he asked, how feasible might it be to scale this up to a much larger object? Well, it's easy enough to hit a much larger object, but by how much are you going to change its velocity? This mm -hmm. was a, a half-ton spacecraft at six kilometres per second. Um, it's a fairly big spacecraft. You're not going to get a spacecraft of many tons uh, mm -hmm. to intercept an Earth-crossing asteroid. Um, but if you do it sufficiently far away from the Earth, the change in velocity you need to impart is, is less. That's right. So it can be done. But the, the, the bodies that are a threat to the Earth, there are no bodies bigger than a few kilometres that are a, a, a potential threat for, mm -hmm. uh, in the foreseeable future. Right. Maybe thousands of years' time, but foreseeable future, no. Yeah. So we're looking to protect ourselves against things that are a sub about one kilometre in size. So we don't have to worry at the moment, about deflecting bodies much bigger than a kilometre. Now, this body was 160 metres. There you go. But, yeah, I think we, we, can, we can make changes of velocity to mm -hmm. bodies right. um, that are likely to hit the Earth. We have so a pretty it can good, be done, Andrew. Good question. Yeah, we have a pretty good sense of what's out there. We, we, we monitor that pretty well. So if something yeah. big was coming our way, you know, we could... Well, we, we intercept it further We out. know more than 90%, maybe it's more than 95% of them. There, there might be a few lurking that we haven't spotted, but the, 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 the surveys have been pretty good. And, and by the way, there is a follow-up mission. There's a European Space Agency mission called HERA, mm -hmm. which is going to launch in a couple of years' time and will take the best part of a year to get out to um, Didymos. So it will image Dimorphos and see the nature of the crater that was made on the surface. Mm -hmm. I mean, those views from the Italian La Chia Cube um, yeah, didn't really show any detail on the surface. It was still ejector coming out and they're right. quite fuzzy images. But we'll have a spacecraft with a much better camera that will go over here mm -hmm. and, and take a good look. And we'll learn what's been done that's by looking at the impact. That's great. So that's, it's, it's an interesting system to, to learn about. Many people are surprised to find that asteroids have moons. I, mean, um, I, I didn't know that. They're, they're not uncommon. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the fraction is, but... You know, about one in a hundred, 
somewhere between one in 100 and one in 10 asteroids have moons. Wow. It's, it's a very high proportion of moons. And some That's asteroids have, more, have a couple of moons. It's usually one moon. That's wild. But tiny bodies with even tinier moons. Mm -hmm. um, now, before we go on to asking more questions, um, to answering more questions, I see your question, Matthew. We'll come to that. Um, Eleanor, you've been looking at the news as well. What do you want to talk to us about? Yes, I wanted to share uh, a new piece of research that's come out in Nature Astronomy, which is a pretty uh, prestigious uh, journal. Uh, it's entitled Surface Topographic Impact of Subglacial Water Beneath the South Polar Ice Cap of Mars, which is just a really great title uh, explaining that uh, through analysis of topographic data, radar data, and um, and modeling, this group of researchers, uh, some at the OU, uh, were able to uh, provide pretty conclusive evidence that there is liquid water under the south polar cap of Mars, which is, I mean, fantastic for those of us looking for, for water on Mars. Uh, and it also clarifies a lot of observations that have been made in the last couple of years that uh, used radar alone uh, to suggest that there would be water present under the ice caps uh, and, and the, the southern polar ice caps, uh, but couldn't definitively say, yes, here's a, here's a great image from Mars Express. Um, this isn't necessarily the part of the ice cap that they studied, mm -hmm. but uh, essentially this work has provided pretty irrefutable evidence that there is water, liquid water, under these caps. Um, it used the sort of new data from uh, topographic profiles from the Mars Laser Alt Orbital Altimeter. Oh, I always get that mixed up. It's a, basically a, a spacecraft in orbit of Mars that can give us um, height measurements over the surface and, and did so over the surface of this, um, of this ice cap. And the, the topography of that surface uh, matched the computer models that would suggest that there was water underneath um, underneath that cap, and so, I mean, this is this is an amazing, uh, an amazing discovery, and a great uh, a great use of multi methods to to arrive at a at a at a pretty great outcome. So. Yeah, and subglacial lakes are potential habitats for life. They are, yes. Uh, if they they are uh, postulated to be on Earth, so there's no reason that it couldn't be on Mars, and so. You know, the search for life on Mars does uh, extend into the subsurface. Yeah. Uh, You'll read about subglacial lakes on Earth in the astrobiology book, Introduction of Astrobiology, you know, Lake Vostok in Antarctica. Yes. And of course, the big habitat for life potentially is, is, is oceans sandwiched between the ice and the rocky and interior the rock, yeah. of icy moons. Mm -hmm. But the same kind of environment is there potentially on Mars exactly. uh, underneath the polar cap. Yes, and you can have your say as to whether you think uh, uh, Mars or maybe an icy moon is more habitable in the widgets here. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a great place for life to have been protected from you know, the harsh environment uh, present at the Martian surface. So this is a, a wonderful piece of um, new research that um, has only come out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that's great. And there's more yeah. ice news from Mars, which there I've is. spotted. Yes. Some of you will have heard about the InSight mission. That's a NASA mission that landed a seismometer on Mars. Mm -hmm. It, as we speak, is dying a slow and agonizing death yeah. because the solar panels are covered in dust. Mm -hmm. Some people say that's design fault in the mission, but it has more than exceeded its design lifetime. Yes. The mission's been a great success. Yeah, it so. measured lots of Mars quakes. Mm -hmm. It's identified the liquid nature of Mars's outer core, which we weren't sure of before. Mm -hmm. uh, there were hints, but we, and we know the size of the core. And during the late latter part of last year, 2021, there were two impacts on Mars yes, yeah. um, that caused measurable Mars quakes. Most of the Mars quakes are, 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 are tectonic, they're, they're faults moving, but two impact generated earthquakes mm -hmm. were found. And we've imaged the craters that were formed. So yes. we know the exact location where these impacts occurred. And that's important because with one seismometer, it's very hard to independently pinpoint the source of your seismic waves. Mm -hmm. We know a crater's been formed. You know exactly where the seismic waves are coming from. And um, here, on the triangle on the left shows where insight is, and the t other two symbols are where the impacts occurred. And we've got small-scale images of the impacts. One of these impacts, if we go to the next picture, um, 
this one here, the black and white view shows the ejector was asymmetrically distributed. Um, the dark streakiness is kind of downrange. The impactor came in at maybe 40 degrees above the horizontal to give that, a, a, that asymmetric ejector pattern. But the crater is still pretty circular. There's a, a, a high resolution view from a different camera of the crater bottom right. But the final slide in this sequence has a, that in more detail. And you see the white stuff distributed around the crater? Yes. The paper in Nature, which is mostly about the, the seismic waves, right. claims this is a detection of ice. They're saying there's an ice layer that was excavated and has come out as ejecta. Mm -hmm. and their only evidence for saying it's ice is that it's white. Right. Now, if they re-image this in a year's time and find that ice has sublimed away, then I'll believe it's ice. It, ice. it could be just silicious rock or something salty or a carbonate. It probably is ice, but... But they but claim definitively that it's ice, which I think is a bit cheeky. <laughs> um, but so this is potentially ice below the surface. That's a hundred. That's uh, yeah, it's about a hundred meter crater. So that ice would have come from maybe twenty meters below the surface. Wow. Um, it's only thirty-five degrees from the equator. Ice has not been proven that close to Mars's equator before. Mm -hmm. So, so that'd, be, that'd be great but, for uh, for uh, human missions. Well, if, 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 if water is that close if, to the surface. Yeah, and if it's not too salty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Actually, that, that brings us to a question that um, Ben asked. Is the liquid water under the ice cap of Mars likely to be very salty? Well, um, what makes oceans salty on the Earth or oceans salty inside an icy moon is you've got hot rock drawing the water in and hydrothermal reactions and chemicals being flushed out of the rock and that's where the salt in the sea comes from. We don't really envisage a lot of this, a, hot, a lot of hot rock below Mars's polar cap at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we haven't got the same kind of hydrothermal circulation going on. Right. So I would doubt that the water below Mars's polar caps is all that salty. Mm -hmm. It's not quite the same situation as under the ice on an icy moon. Right. Um, no. Which actually makes it a less attractive habitat for life because life below the ice has got no sunlight for photosynthesis. So where does your energy come from? It's chemical. You need hot rock, hot rock. and water yes. circulating. Yeah. So although I said earlier, water under Mars is ice, habitat for life. Well, yes, life could maybe live there, but what's it going to feed off? Do, nu yes, nutrients <laughs> released by the chemical alteration of the rock. I mean, it's which is very slow unless very the rock slow. is hot, drawing stuff yeah. in. But it, it could yeah. work. It could, it could. work. It's, yeah. a, it's a place to go and look. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What other questions do we have? What well, Matthew's saying: Do we have a good idea of the density and makeup of asteroids before we hit them to avoid breaking them apart? Well. Unless we've been there, we don't know for sure. Many asteroids, Matthew, are rubble piles. Almost everything we've seen at high enough re resolution is a pile of rubble. Right. Um, they're also surprisingly low density, um, which means void space is inside. Mm -hmm. um, if an asteroid has a moon, you can measure the mass of the asteroid very precisely from the orbital period of its moon. Right. Uh, so we will have a much better idea of the density of... Um, of Didymos, the big, big asteroid, big asteroid yes. um, because of the orbital period of Dimorphos mm -hmm. around it. I haven't seen those figures worked up yet, but they all are all quite low density. But so you might think they would fly apart very easily, mm -hmm. but um, I guess it depends how interlocked, there may be void spaces, but how interlocking Locked. of these jagged bits right. of rock, if you hit it hard enough, you might cause the things to hang together rather than fly then apart. Fly and that apart. might be what's happened in the case of a big shock that Didymos suffered when Dark crashed into it. it, flew up, it, it the crater was excavated right. and a plume of ejector was, was flung out, but it did not shake the whole body apart. And this is what we're learning. But, I mean, we, we don't know um, that that's going to happen all the time. It's only been tried once, but it's encouraging that we didn't <laughs> yeah. break this moon apart. Um, Marvin asks a similar sort of t uh, in the same vein. Uh, when we talk about merging planetesimals or planetary embryos colliding, it seems like we assume two masses become one. Is this the case or could some hit uh, at an angle ricocheting off in other directions or either skim each other uh, where they were they all head-on collisions? Uh, no, they're not all head-on collisions. 
Um, you, you will read, I don't know, Marvin, if you're an S283 student, late on in chapter eight or nine of Introduction to the Solar System, you'll learn about collisions and the hierarchical way in which we think the, uh, the debris early in the solar system um, collided and, generally speaking, grew into successively larger bodies. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it was more common for things to break each other apart when they collided, we'd have no planets and we wouldn't be here talking to you now. Um, um, growth at the right range of velocities, oh, well, collisions at the right range of velocities encourages growth. Now, out in the asteroid belt where Jupiter was stirring things up, things mm -hmm. were, were breaking apart more often than they were growing. Right. So you do need the right conditions to grow planets. Um, and very often things do merge, and that's how, that's how planets grow. But you, you can, if, if you've got the right, uh, if you've got very particular um, configurations, oblique impacts, glancing blows, if you like, you can form a moon, a giant impact into the Earth of something maybe Mars size or smaller than Mars into the proto Earth, hit the Earth, threw out some debris, which formed the moon around the Earth. That's the most favoured model for lunar mm -hmm. formation. Yep. The planet Mercury, where I work, um, possibly is a surviving hit and run impact. And what is now Mercury could have hit something in the region of the Earth or in the region of Venus that may have been proto-Earth or proto-Venus. And the incoming Mercury parent in this impact was stripped of most of its rocky mantle mm -hmm. and all that, was, all that survived was the core plus a small amount of rock right. and that's now ended up as Mercury. Mercury has a much bigger iron core than it should for its total size. It's a, very, it's a dense body, it's got a very thin shell of silicate, rocky material surrounding an iron core and that could have been a hit and run impactor. Mm -hmm. So there are different end results of impacts, um, uh, Marvin. Yeah. And there's a lot of active research going on in that field. Not here, we don't do that here. <laughs> we haven't got super enough computers, but... No, yeah. but that's, 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 a, a big field. that's a great question. Should we talk about Mercury then, since let's, I've come on to Mercury? Yeah, let's continue on with Mercury. So let's have some more questions in there, yes, please, please, people. Let us know. But, um, as Eleanor mentioned, I'm working on the Bepi Colombo mission, which is the European Space Agency's mission to Mercury, joint European Japanese Space Agency mission to Mercury. It's, um, it will get into orbit about Mercury in December 2025. So that's only just over three years away mm -hmm. now. It's getting close. Wow. Um, but it has several flybys of Mercury en route. Each time it flybys, it slows down a bit. So eventually we arrive traveling slowly enough to get captured into orbit. That's amazing. So let's have a look at the slides. Uh, um, we're not doing a lot of science during the flybys because the spacecraft is traveling in a stacked configuration. What you see there is that the, the, the rearmost thing with the jets coming out, that's the, the iron drive, that's the propulsion unit. In front of it is what will become the Mercury Planetary Orbiter. In front of that, inside the Sun Shield, is the Japanese orbiter called MIO. Um, until they get into orbit and separate, mm. most of the instruments can't see the planet, as the next slide will, will show you. Oh, well, now there's a spacecraft in the, in the Science Museum in London with me for scale. <laughs> it is big. It looks, um, yeah. The next gallery has a full-sized Apollo um, lunar excursion module, and, and they're a similar size. It's a big spacecraft. So here, here's the four parts of the spacecraft. The, the Japanese orbiter at top, which is spin stabilized, but most of the thing is a sun shield to protect it from the sun during cruise. MPO is the European orbiter, and then there's a transfer unit. Now the main cameras are in, in MPO, but they, they can't see the sky because they're obscured by the rest of the spacecraft stack. But at a late stage in planning, very late stage, these things called MCAM, which are shown in red, were added to the outside of the transfer module. They're not as big as drawn there. That's just to show their positions. And we have, we have MCAM images from the flybys. And the, um, the second flyby was in June this year. There's the, almost the first image from, from one of the MCAMs during um, the flyby sequence. We've got bits of the spacecraft in the foreground, which is a, sort of a shame, but it makes the pictures more dramatic. And these are just 1024 by 1024 panchromatic webcams, basically. And um, you can see a lot of detail. There's a lot. We're very pleased with the camera performance. We had a bit of trouble getting exposures right on Flyby 1. Flyby 2 worked perfectly. And there's a, 
I don't know if you can see, we'll go to the next slide where, where an arrow should appear. There's a linear feature there with the arrowhead pointing at it, running up and down the image. That's, a, that's an escarpment, that's a fault feature. Now, we, 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 we have got better images of this from the NASA orbiter called Messenger, which orbit, uh, orbited Mercury for four years, but not in these illumination conditions. We knew we were going to see this feature right. uh, during this flyby, and it had never been named. So we applied to the International Astronomical Union to get a name for this feature so it could refer to it by name in the press release. And was that successful? Yeah, they said, yeah, you can have a name. And th th there's a convention for naming these escarpments on Mercury, which is to name them after ships used in voyages of discovery. And they decided to call that one Challenger. Oh, very apt. So this is, uh, the, 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 the descriptor term is rupees, which is Latin for escarpments. So this is Challenger rupees. And for those of you who need your memory jogging, HMS Challenger was an 1870s Royal Navy ship which mapped the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. It brought up dredge samples from four kilometres down, pretty much discovered the, the mid-Atlantic ridge and did similar very deep surveys in other oceans of the world. It really was a really amazing scientific voyage on, on Challenger. So it was nice to see that name given, given to that feature there. Yeah. Forever so, immortalized. On, immortalized on, on Mercury. Mercury. Um, the Challenger Space Shuttle was named after HMS Challenger, I think. The Challenger oh. name has a long pedigree it going does. back to HMS Challenger. Um, so let's just see the sequence of images uh, as we flew by. You just see Mercury passing by behind the spacecraft as we go. If we just keep, keep clicking through. So this is the changing view. We're getting further from the Terminator and more towards the, the sub-solar point here. But there's wonderful detail visible there. And there might be another picture from this camera before we see the view from uh, one of the other cameras. Yeah, I think that's the last view from this camera. And then we've got a sequence of three pictures from one of the other cameras, different bits of a spacecraft in the foreground. That's a low gain antenna there, a medium gain antenna that you see in the, in the foreground there with Mercury passing by behind it. And finally, a view from the other monitoring camera, different bits of spacecraft in the way. So we're pleased with that. We, we may even get some science out of these images. They're That's not right. science instruments, uh, but, but they, we, we, they, yeah. they have it's this a, fantastic photos. They're, they're lovely photos, and we are seeing things with lighting conditions um, that we may not get at any other time. But, but the illumination of the surface is very important in, in bringing out subtle, top, subtle topographic features. So we're, we're pleased to have those pictures. Well, there you go. And, and to sort of in the same vein, um, Isfan was asking, do you have a favorite quadrant on Mercury? <laughs> oh, Isfan. Um, um, Mercury, for mapping purposes, is, is divided into 15 mapping quadrangles, mm -hmm. one at either pole. We have a couple behind yeah. us here. Yeah, wow, we've got big ones here. I have PhD students making geological maps of Mercury. Here is one. Here are all the quadrangles on Mercury up here, and this one coloured in here. This is this was mapped by our buddy Jack Wright. Um, my favourite quadrangle oh, probably is this one actually, because it has the biggest explosive volcanic deposit on the planet, the Ter Facula. Yeah. But they're all good. I, I've, I've had five students now start PhDs, each of them mapping a quadrangle. So we're going to map five of the 15 quadrangles of Mercury at the Open University. That's quite an achievement. Well, that, that is. Yeah. And every student I've said, that I've said, here's a quadrangle, go and map it, and find something interesting as well to write up about the science. Not just, we don't just want a map, we want some science. Every time they've found some good science, whether it's explosive volcanoes, or, or, or blocks of volatile material flung out, or strange fault patterns, or extension where you should see compression, or um, ejector that has flowed out in a low bait fashion from craters, like some craters you'll read about in Mars, on Mars in chapter four of the ISS. There's all kinds of things going on on Mercury that we did not expect, and very often they're telling us it's rich in volatile materials. We don't expect something close to the sun formed violently by stripping away most of its rock to still retain a lot of volatiles. It's, it's a weird planet. So I love all of Mercury, but the ones with the biggest explosive volcanic deposits are the quadrangles that I like bestest, Van, if you, if you push me. <laughs> I was going to say Hawkeye as well. Uh, only, you know, 
uh, because when when I uh, started my position here, I didn't realize uh, how much work uh, goes into m mapping Mercury. I was very ignorant of that. Uh, and Jack Wright, who, who made that map, uh, was kind enough to walk me through that. So it'll always be sort of the first quadrangle I really identified with. But it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, got a lot of really that's, interesting That's Hokusai on the right. Yeah. So the images that uh, your students uh, are mapping, those are from Messenger? We're using images from the previous mission, NASA mission, which is called Messenger. So by the time Bepi Colombo gets there, we'll have all 15 quadrangles mapped, and mm -hmm. that will set the context for our observations with Bepi Colombo, which will measure the elemental abundances at the surface much better than Messenger was able to do. Mm -hmm. It will get 3D imaging, so stereoscopic imaging. Uh, there's, there's an imaging spectrometer, so we'll get the visible and near-infrared spectra, so we'll understand the mineralogy, which we'll also get from thermal infrared imaging, so we'll get much better data. So we'll throw away these geological maps and make a new set with much better data, and at higher resolution. Yeah. Um, Ruta is asking, are there operational challenges uh, working, using a spacecraft back close to the sun? Yes, indeed, there are, Ruta. Um, you are three times closer to the sun than you are at the Earth, mm -hmm. so three squared is nine, nine times more intense solar radiation heating your spacecraft. And when you're on the day side of the planet, you've got a planetary surface at four or five hundred Celsius cooking you from one side and the sun cooking you from the other. So here's a planet, here's the sun, and the spacecraft in between gets fried. It is very difficult to keep the spacecraft cool. Mm -hmm. Bepi Colombo has radiator panels. Um, we have to roll the spacecraft every um, half orbit around the sun to stop the sunlight ever shining in. And it has a cold finger to draw the heat out from the interior to let it radiate away to space. NASA's mission had to hide behind a sun shield and, yes. and go in a very elliptical probe. orbit. Yeah. Um, it was close to the planet's north pole but then its orbit took it a long way away over the South Pole. It was like two or three hundred kilometres from the surface here, oh, okay. but 40,000 over the South Pole wow. to give it time to cool so down because yeah. you travel fast when you're close and slowly when you're mm -hmm. a long way away. That's Kepler's laws. So they had to work very carefully with the orbit and hiding behind the sun shield with Messenger. We've got a more sophisticated, thermally cooled, a spacecraft with Bepi Colombo. Yes. We hope it works. The thermal design is one reason the mission was so late to, to the launch pad. Right. Um, but it is a very challenging environment. That's mm -hmm. a good question, Ruta. That's great. Um, I think we've dealt with, with the questions. We've not got very long. We've got another five minutes if, you want to, if anybody wants to squeeze a question in. But Eleanor, you mentioned... Um, um, the Rosalind Franklin rover on right. ExoMars. Yes. Now, this should have launched this winter. In September, and yes, yeah. In September. It should have oh, launched yeah, yeah. in September. This winter, we learned, with spring, we learned we had to cancel the mission. Since we had to suspend because the mission. We're just suspending so, it. Sorry. Yes, we're just suspending it. Because there was a Russian landing system and, in fact, a Russian launcher. Yes. Which now we can't use. No. So... You can launch to Mars every two years. About when two is years. it going to go? Well, <laughs> the, uh, ESA is uh, the European Space Agency is currently looking into options uh, to make sure that Rosalind Franklin flies. It's um, a remarkable piece of technology in a roving astrobiological uh, laboratory. So we're very keen to see it to see it get to Mars. Uh, as you said, you can launch every two years. Two years uh, from from now is is too soon. Yeah. Fortunately, four years is is an okay window. Uh, most likely, it will launch in 2028, so in six years from now. Uh, it gives ESA uh, and any partners that are brought on uh, time to build a landing platform uh, and an opportunity to uh, ensure specification for. Uh, for rocket launch, essentially, so uh, it is, it is still it's still an ongoing mission. We're still looking for ways to make sure that it, it flies to Mars to do the amazing science that it's it's proposed to do, um, but but probably not for another six years. Those announcements should be made hopefully by the end of the year. Yeah. yeah. 
but it, it is a good mission and it's, it it's nice to know yeah. it, it, it's almost, it's very likely to be rescued. Yeah. It looks that way, yes. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, we have a question from um, Raghunath. Um, is there a way to predict something unknown coming in from outside our solar system like Oumuamua? Um, mm. Oumuamua is a body that came by a couple of years ago. 2017, I think. Five years ago? Was it? Doesn't time fly? Anyway, yeah. a few <laughs> years ago, a, a body was discovered um, on a hyperbolic orbit. It's not come from inside the solar system. Mm -hmm. It was quite elongated as well to judge from a light curve. Probably, almost certainly an interstellar visitor. And there um, was something similar in the past year that's been seen. We are picking up things which appear to have come from outside the solar system mm -hmm. now. Um, well, there isn't a way to predict them because we can't see them until they get here. But if they're big enough, like Oumuamua was, you can see them a year or two before perihelion. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's time to launch something to deflect it, if it's a big object, that probably isn't. But it's very, these things are very unlikely to be hitting the Earth. The solar system is vast yes. and something coming in from outside um, is very unlikely to hit us. And it won't even be in the plane of the ecliptic. Um, asteroids in the solar system are concentrated in the same plane that the Earth orbits. Mm -hmm. So, and many of them are in orbits which intersect the Earth. So they're much more of a threat than something interstellar. Um, very difficult to, you can't predict interstellar objects and the warning you would get is only a year or two at best. Mm -hmm. I think, I, th I think that's, you yeah. agree with that? Yes, I do. Do you concur, yeah. Dr. Favreau? Do I concur? I do, I do. <laughs> it's, um, it's always great uh, when something new enters our solar system because it gives us an opportunity to learn about what's uh, what's out there. Um, but I think it it be it be such a bad day on Earth if it was uh, if it if it just sort of happened to have the right specifications and, and be in the right you know line and the right orbits to, to hit us. I think that's um, pretty rare. Yeah. Okay. Questions are coming in now. Uh, Marvin, how much has the cost of living crisis and fuel crisis affected our timetable for what we wanted to achieve? There's an ESA ministerial meeting happening very soon. It hasn't happened yet, has it? No, I don't believe I'm, so. I'm not sure we've even got a science minister to send, have we, from this country? But, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it, it is a worry. Um, we, we don't know uh, which nations are going to maintain their science budgets and which, which aren't. NASA has delayed, um, is it Veritas, its Venus mission? Yes, its Venus mission. Um, that, wasn't in, that wasn't entirely due to financial reasons. So we, but we had all kinds of management issues at Jet Propulsion Lab during COVID and so on. But Yeah, co I mean, we're still feeling the ripple effects yeah. from COVID as well. So all of this just sort of compounding uh, makes it a challenge. Uh, but we hope, at least I hope, that uh, governments uh, in Europe and around the world recognize the the ad, the benefit of, of funding this kind of research uh, and keep up those budgets so that we can do the work that we do and make the discoveries that we're making. Mm. Andrew Ellison says, is the retrograde rotation of Venus likely to be due to a collision? It might be. Yeah. Something strange has happened. Venus rotates very slowly retrograde, doesn't it? Yes, um, 213 days. To, oh, well to, done. I think that... You can look it up in Appendix A. and It is something like that. I, th I, th I think so. Yeah. Um, it should have been rotating prograde like everything else. Mm -hmm. um, the objects which formed Venus were probably all rotating that way. So, But some collision has may well have um, slowed okay. it down, made it go backwards. Um, it, it's the likeliest theory. Um, there's another um, question here from... Uh, William, uh, Mercury has an orbit that needed a relativistic explanation. Is this an issue when putting an orbiter in place around Mercury? Okay, what William's referring to there is the advance of Mercury's perihelion. Oh. The closest point in Mercury's orbit to the Sun, its perihelion, um, migrates around the orbit uh, by a, a tiny amount. It's only seconds per mm. century or something, seconds of arc. Very slowly. Oh, very slow, okay. Um, um, 
by an amount that can't be explained by Newtonian mechanics. And it is because of the bending of space-time, because of the sun's mass. Um, but no, when you're putting a spacecraft into orbit about Mercury, um, you don't have to worry about relativistic effects. What you can do, though, one of the aims of a Bepi-Colombo mission, by being close to the sun, into, in the sun's gravity well, is we might use that location to see mm. you know, very, very subtle effects on the orbit of the spacecraft, oh, right. which can test whether relativity uh, is correct in every detail. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have to take relativity, relativity into account in getting to Mercury, but once we're there, if there's anything that doesn't quite stack up, it might have a relativistic inter uh, interpretation. I think it's a long shot myself. Yeah, but that's that's one of the aims of the mission is to test relativity. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Robin. Uh, they ask, does having more launch services coming from the UK help with making more missions possible going forward for UK science? Um, launching from spacecraft, launching from aircraft that take off from Newquay Airport or from small launch sites in Scotland, you're going to low Earth orbit. These are not deep space missions, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So no, but good for but technology you, demonstrators or, or Earth observation. Yes, yeah, there are def there are, uh, other nations that do that uh, far more effectively and efficiently than than the UK does. Um, so. I mean, something to think about, for yeah. sure. And we will have to stop. But Marvin is saying, what causes wind on other planets? Mostly planetary rotation. Planetary rotation, yeah. And the, um, the differential heating, uh, it's basically the same way uh, wind uh, happens on Earth, the differential heating between uh, areas with uh, high solar um, insulation and low solar insulation. And uh, is it insulation? Yes. Insulation. In fact, you're right, but the, the rotation affects the direction, the direction of, the wind, of the wind, but the causes of the wind in the first place is the, the is, solar insulation. Is, is the insulation. So you'll always, yeah. um, sort of the, the gas laws, you try to um, even out uh, areas of high pressure and low pressure. Uh, and it's so that th the Earth and other, and other planetary bodies are always trying to even out that pressure gradient. And that's how you get the yeah. uh, rotation, or sorry, the, the, the um, development of wind and then the rotation of the body. Yeah. Uh, creates the rotation of the wind. And read chapters five and six of Introduction to the Solar System. We're going to have to draw it to a halt there because we've nearly taken an hour. Wow. Um, but what we want to do is to... Where's the last page? <laughs> <laughs> we, want to, we want to look at the widgets and see... Uh, yes. Um, see. see what people have done. Um, what modules are you studying? Nobody's had a go at that. So that's no good. I'm not seeing... Uh, oh, it's not refreshing. Oh, there refresh. they are. They're up on the screen for us there. Okay, thank, okay you. thank you. 19 of you are studying S283, 11 S284. I guess some of you may be studying both. Nobody from SPX S288 and three others. Okay, next widget, please. If the good people in the back room, what's your favourite planet? Mars. Oh, no, Saturn. Saturn one. <laughs> Is that because of the rings, I wonder? It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, chaotic yeah, world. I'll read this out because we don't necessarily capture these. 15 for Mercury, 11% Venus, 26% Mars, 15% Jupiter, 33% Saturn. Fully one third of people think Saturn's their favourite planet. We've got a little bit of movement here. Should, but should we have put Earth on that list? We might. We might. Uh, what about your favourite moon? The oh, moon, and our, Euro ooh, ooh, Europa coming up, ooh, neck and neck between eye. Europa and the moon. No one for oh. Io? Oh. Hey, 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 before we finish, can we please go to the two Europa pictures? I'd love to show you oh, those. Oh, those are fantastic. Um, Juno, um, the NASA mission in polar orbit about Jupiter, had a close flyby of Europa, its first and only one. Here's a lovely view of Europa. You'll see more about Europa in Chapter 4 of Introduction to Astrobiology. That's a lovely colour view of Europa. Look at the topographic features picked out by the shadowing as you get close to the Terminator. And the final picture is from the Stellar Reference Unit. This is a camera on board the spacecraft for taking navigation pictures of the stars. This is about a 150 kilometre wide area of Europa at night. Wow. 
uh, lit up by Jupiter. And, and we see the, the ball of string um, um, texture on the planet, on the planet, on the moon's surface, probably caused by tidal cracks expanding and contracting and squeezing mm -hmm. out slush. And that sort of uh, distorted oval shaped feature at the bottom is a chaos region where the ice shell has been broken apart and either mush or liquid water has welled up and that's a region that wasn't well imaged before so we're that's learning fantastic. about Europa and I'm glad it's so many people's favorite moon we're going to have to finish now thank you for making the questions lively in the end we're worried when nobody sent any questions in advance but it turns out we had plenty to talk about Eleanor thank you for giving up your evening oh, after pleasure. flying back overnight from Toronto as well I that did. was really good thank you thank you very much <laughs> and Kate and Benny in the back room thank you for making it happen We'll have another Planets and Moons chat in March and S283 students will know about that and I'll share the news with the same group of non-S283 people as well and we'll have the Moons MOOC people with us then as well. Um, so until then, bye-bye um, and enjoy S283 if you're studying.